Hello out there, it's Paul Coliani. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's gain some momentum. Hey, this is Paul Coliani with Minutes to Momentum. This is kind of an offshoot of The Overwhelmed Brain. It's that mini show I like to put in every now and then. I have no consistency on it. (laughs) It's been like three weeks since I did it last. Uh, Typically, I have a lot of notes in front of me, and um, today I don't. So I'm really, 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 really off the cuff. And I've just filled in a whole bunch of space with the word really. So you can tell I'm just making it up as I go along. But (laughs) what I wanted to do is uh, I had an interview by someone a friend of mine named Richard Ryerson. He does the Dose of Leadership podcast, always, always in the top uh, of self-help. And I've listened to his show. I love his show. And the reason I love it so much is because I went into it thinking it was all about leadership. Like, you need to be a leader. You need to be someone who commands and is, is present and you're there for people. But there's so much more to being a leader and his show is is really about personal growth and expanding yourself and from building yourself from the inside and moving out it it's like it's the expansion of yourself i guess that's the best way to put it so he reached out to me and said hey why don't you be on my show and i'm like me <laughs> be on your show i'm not sure why because you know i'm not in the military i'm not in corporate and he's like what do you think the dose of leadership is all about? So <laughs> that's that's when he said, you know, this is more of a personal growth show than anything. So uh, I went on the show and it was one of my favorite in- interviews. I get, I've gotten interviewed at least, I don't know, eight or ten times so far in different people's shows. But I've always been afraid to post my interview on my feed, on my overwhelmed brain feed. And the reason is because when I listen to, to those shows that I've done, I don't sound like myself. Like right now, I feel like myself. I sound like myself. But when I'm on other shows, I don't feel like myself. I don't sound like myself. And I think sometimes it has to do with the rapport that I have with the host. If there's a if we're just getting to know each other, it's 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 kind of awkward sometimes. I you know you know those conversations. But for some reason I immediately clicked with Richard and we've known each other for a few months because we've been in some different Facebook groups online together, but we've never really sat down and talked. And and this is one of those times where we did. And I just thought it went great. So I'm now standing up and being brave and saying, okay, world, here's me off the cuff in an interview with someone else who's interviewing me. So (laughs) <laughs> it was a, a big step for me because I'm used to having my own show and being in more control. And it's it's definitely some a step I needed to take. And it has taken me a while to become, I'm going to admit, a good guest. Because when you're a guest, you kind of want to be impressive to someone else's audience. So I think my ego kicked in and said, I'm not that impressive to other people's audiences, but you know, I need to take these steps anyway. Then my ego stopped and I said, I need to take those steps and be more comfortable in my own skin and be more comfortable being me. Even if the host isn't that good or conversation isn't going that well, I can just be myself. So I'm going to stop rambling and I'm going to actually play Richard's entire uh, podcast his the entire episode with me and I'll let you just go ahead and listen to this amazing interviewer he's a great guy and I hope you get something from it um, I'm going to leave in all his sponsors and everything that he talks about it'll just it'll be just like you're on his show so his show is the dose of leadership you're going to hear it right now and I'm going to let it end with his music at the end. I won't be closing this show with the Minutes to Momentum music. So at the end, that is the end. Not that you need to know that because once the blank space comes up, you'll realize, oh, I guess it's over. (laughs) But I usually end every show with my own music. But this time, since I'm putting this in my feed, uh, what we call our feed, it's the feed of or the list of shows. Since I put this in my feed, you'll get 
his show, his music, and it'll end off like that. So I really hope you enjoy it. You are amazing, and I will talk to you soon. Welcome to another episode of the Dose of Leadership podcast, the show that brings you inspiring and educational interviews with today's most relevant and motivating leaders. Each episode is dedicated to highlight real-life leadership and influence experts who dedicate their lives to the pursuit of the truth, common sense, and courageous leadership. And now, here's your host, Richard Ryerson. Hey, hey, welcome to the show. Richard Ryerson here. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate your support. Please make sure you're telling your friends, your family, your coworkers all about this show. Keep this community growing. I appreciate your support. We're continually rising in the iTunes rankings, and I couldn't do it without your support. If you haven't done so, please go to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review, and let let the world know what you think about this show. Again, thank you so much for your support. I want to introduce to you my new partners to the show, 99designs. You know, they've been so great with me and helping me with my design of my business. You know, it's all about selection, speed, and creativity. These are just a few benefits of having several designers work for you and helping you on your project. So if you want to start your next design project, I encourage you to go to 99designs.com slash leadership and get a $99 power pack of services absolutely free. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to have on my show my friend Paul Coliani. He is the host of the Overwhelmed Brain blog and podcast. It's one of my favorite podcast. I got to be honest, I don't listen to a lot because I don't have a lot of time, but this is one of my go-tos. And I met Paul, I don't know, maybe seven, eight months ago in a mastermind that we uh, got associated with. And I just love Paul's work. He's all about personal growth. He's all about critical thinking. You know, he's not into the, into the crystals or affirmations or anything like that. It's all about, you know, looking at life as an ever-changing journey filled with thoughts, emotions, in an unending series of unpredictable behaviors. He fits right into the Dose of Leadership tribe. And Paul, welcome to the Dose of Leadership podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm listening to your intro going, I got to steal that intro. That is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been a fan of you, Paul, for a long time. You know, I mean, you've helped me out. Uh, you know, being in a mastermind, you know, we talked about this on this podcast, the power of the masterminds. I'm sure that you have experienced the same thing that I have. You can't get through life uh, all by yourself, and uh, you've been a tremendous help for me, and I've been wanting to ha- bring you on the show because I love what you talk about on your podcast. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and the overwhelmed brain and how it all got started. Wow, where do I begin? Um, I was in technology most of my life, so this personal growth thing kind of snuck up on me when I had to deal with all the dysfunction in my life uh, as far as <laughs> growing up in an alcoholic household, and you know, you bring this stuff from childhood into the present day. And if you don't deal with it, you basically hold on to pain and what we hear called limiting beliefs and all this basically crap that we, that if we don't deal with it, it affects every decision. It it affects everything we do in life. So it it started coming up in my thirties and I'm 44 now. So I started really getting into my own personal growth and development. And uh, I learned a lot, read a lot, like a lot of people do, but I decided to take it further and go, I want to teach this stuff. I'm learning so much about myself. I want to teach this stuff. So I ended up going to um, some classes that I took and get certifications, got certified in hypnosis. And a lot of people know the term NLP, but if you don't, it's like a brain science that talks about communication. And so there's a lot of stuff that I learned that helped others. So I was learning myself as I was helping others. And then eventually uh, even up to last year, I was still in technology, but um, I was doing kind of both. I was doing coaching, personal growth coaching and uh, technology. And then I finally said, you know, I think I'm done working with computers and I'm just going to go uh, do this personal growth thing. So last year I started my own blog. I started my podcast and and I really enjoyed uh, spreading myself even further out there than just one person at a time. So having the podcast has done that and you mentioned the mastermind, and of, of course, most of my progress and growth online has been through being in a mastermind, so I'm glad that you mentioned that too. Yeah, you know, I find it kind of funny, it, in, and I don't know if it's just because uh, we have similar experiences, but I know a lot of people, and I'm 45, and it's almost like you went through your 20s and your 30s trying to, I don't know if repress is the right word, but it certainly um, not deal with the authenticity of 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 your reality does that make sense i mean maybe that's kind of um 
redundant there, but the authenticity of, of, of what your situation is all about. And I think for me anyway, it seems like there was always, or I was always trying to, all my actions, all my um, decisions and life decisions were really based on what I thought I should be doing instead of tapping into focusing on my strengths of who I really was or am. Does that make sense? Well, you, yeah, you said that perfectly, almost to the point where it, it kind of triggered a thought in me where you go, you're a teenager and then you get into your 20s and like you said, you're not really dealing with reality yet. It's right. You're still doing things. You're still, and I see it as you're still discovering the world. I mean, in your teens, you're discovering sexuality. So that's all you think about. And then right. you, get, you, have to get, you have to get out of school and you have to get work. So that's all you're thinking about work. And now you got to make money. And then finally, you're starting to settle down a little bit. And you get into your 30s and you're starting to uh, create life or, I mean, more than just human life, but just create your own life and get yourself out there. So I, I have a feeling that after all these years of discovery and then you finally get to settle down and, and you're living life a little bit, then this stuff starts to creep up that has been in the background for a long time. Yeah, real long time. You, <laughs> you know, and I think that, um, I don't know, I guess that's kind of the point where people call it, I hate to be cliche, with a midlife crisis or whatever it is. But it's to me, it's yeah. almost like a discovery or an awareness of of what you're supposed to be doing. But, you know, you do see people in their 20s, and I wish I, you know, I hate to look back and regret, but how great it would have been if you could have understood in your 20s and your 30s that it is all about finding your purpose and living out your purpose. And and if you would have spent all that energy trying to find out what you were put on this planet to do, how further along would you be? I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Why don't we in our 20s, you know, focus on what we're supposed or what we're put on this planet to do? Well, I, I still think it's it's that part of discovery. It's like when you're a kid or even a baby. When you're a baby, you're, you're learning how to talk. You're learning how to see the world. You're learning you're learning what the different sounds are in your world. But and, and we're we st- we're still like that as we grow up. And then when we're a teenager and we want to rebel a little bit and we want to go, I I want to do the things that people don't tell me not to do. It's so much discovery and experience that we're actually in being experiencing things. It, it really is a childlike enjoyment. And, and there's more to it than that. But that's how I see it is that when we get into our 20s, we're still enjoying so much. We think that we're, um, what's the word? Uh, invincible. <laughs> we just right. think we're invincible. And right. that life, there's, we're, so, we're so far from dying of old age that there's absolutely no way we're going to die. So why bother, you know, saving money. Why bother, you know, doing a lot of things that we do now. I do know people in their twenties that have got it, that just got it early. They, they figured it out. They, they, um, learned how to save money. They got that perfect job. They just had a more, uh, hardcore structured sensibility of things. And someone like me, I was, I was more free flowing. I was just enjoying things as I was younger and I didn't learn too much until much later. Well, and I guess the good news is it's never too late to start the best situation or the best classroom setting to start your personal growth and your transformation is the exact setting you find yourself in right now. You just have to opt in, really, is what it's all about, correct? That's, that's what happened to me. Uh, as soon as I, you know, the world is a reflection for what's going on in our lives. So when when we're living our life and all this bad stuff is happening or or just different bad things, what we consider bad you, you stop pointing the finger out and go you know what there's there's something going on in me that's causing all this to happen because we're setting up our lives 10 years from now right now yeah so 10 years from now what i'm doing today is what's going to happen 10 years from now so if 10 years from now i'm still in the same place or bad things still happen i gotta think about what i was doing 10 years ago and go okay how did I not set this up right? And I've really got to take responsibility and be accountable for everything that's going on in my life. That's so true. And it's kind of painful to believe that the decisions, the, the, the state and the reason why you're at what you're at right now are based on your decisions and your life choices. And that's, that can be tough to swallow yeah. sometimes. It is. And Jeff Olson wrote a book called The Slight Edge. Have you heard of that? I have heard of it. I haven't, I haven't read it, though. Have you ever heard of The Compound Effect? I have, but I haven't read that one either. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's put it on your list. The compound effect is basically uh, based on the slight edge. And the slight edge, Jeff Olson talks about, 
Every single little thing you do repeatedly day after day after day leads to success in whatever you want in life. And I'm sure you know that kind of philosophy, but yeah. he really breaks it down in that book. And uh, he says that when you eat this greasy hamburger today, you're not going to feel the effects or see the effects today. You just won't. Right. But six months from now, you will. And so I think that us human beings, a lot of us have a mentality of, hey, I can smoke a cigarette today. It's not going to affect me. It's one cigarette, you know, and then they say the same thing, the next cigarette and the next cigarette. And they say the same thing over and over again. And, And that compound effect of doing something If you're doing something that's good for you, it's going to be better for you later. If you're doing something that's bad for you, it's going to compound into something worse. This is what I don't understand about myself and humans in general. Why is it that I know that I know that I will feel better if I exercise regularly? I know that I will feel better if I am intentional about every day, you know, reading something positive, hanging around myself by positive people. But why is it do I go back like a dog? eating its own vomit, going back and doing the things that shouldn't, shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing. Why do we do that? I really think that it has to do with you get so disciplined in your life that you end up needing a break. I mean, I've sat at my computer for 16 hours plus straight, you know, for several days at a time. But there's a point where I just go, you know what? I just want to put in a movie and turn off. Yeah. I, I just have to turn off. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people is that they're going, they're going, they're going. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. And then it's like, oh, I'm just going to have a piece of cheesecake and mm-hmm. <laughs> sit in front of the computer or sit in front of a movie or whatever. So, yeah, that's what I think is that that's what happens to me, at least. Um, I haven't really thought about that too much, but that is true, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think that – and I, I was just talking – in my last couple of interviews, we've talked about this a lot. And I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned from – um talking to the guests on this podcast and has been a revelation for me in the last 20 months or so is that as you know some people that I've put onto some high pedestals and I've talked to some people I never thought I would talk to before but when we when you get down to it in the brass tacks everybody deals with um negative self-talk negative self-image and dealing with confidence at various degrees everybody there's not one person that I've known that I haven't talked to that doesn't admit, if they could be completely honest, doesn't admit that they don't struggle with negative self-talk, negative self-image. What is your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that's that's something deep down in your unconscious mind that it's coming up to remind you of something that you haven't dealt with yet. So when you have any sort of negative self-talk like, oh, I'm so stupid. Right. Oh, why do I do that? I'm so stupid. Uh I'm trying to remember the trick I used to do for that, but um, there are there are little brain tricks that you can do to uh, just just kind of break yourself of that negative self talk. I can't think of it right now. I wrote a whole blog on it once. <laughs> I just I'm in the moment right now, but uh, but yeah, it's so true. We all have something that comes up, but it's I, I do want to say it's not bad. I think the first thing that people think is that oh, I just put myself down and then they feel bad for putting themselves down. Right. So it becomes like a cycle. Exactly. So my first thought is don't think it's bad. Just follow it up with something like, Oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, this is what I remember. This is what I remember writing about. Oh, I'm so stupid, but I'm going to do something to make it better next time. Yeah. I like that. If you could, yeah, if you could follow it up with something that way, you allow yourself to have the emotions, the feelings, because if you have any type of resistance to what's coming, it creates more resistance, more pain, more hurt. So just allow yourself to have it. Damn it, I'm so stupid. I'm an idiot. But next time I'm going to do it better so I don't feel this way or I don't do that same thing. Yeah. No, that's a great point. You're right because it's almost like calling yourself stupid triggers a guilt cycle that's tough to get out yes. of. Yeah. Yeah, the vicious cycle, you're right. I, I saw, you know who Stephen Pressfield is? Um, I've heard that name. I don't know he, what he did. He's written um, he on the, especially on the warrior culture, he understands it quite a bit. But he also is probably his most um, popular book is uh, The War of Art. And, yes, um, I've heard of that. He talks about that a lot. In fact, I saw him on um, on Sunday. Oprah was interviewing him on her Super Soul Sunday or whatever. Yes, I watch Oprah sometimes. I'm 
I can I'm confident enough in my masculinity to admit that. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but That's great. He, I mean, he's I, he's I've been trying to get him on my show forever, and he's just such a I love his work and material because he writes a lot about again um, about kind of the Marine Corps and the SEALs and all that. So he's really tapped into that culture and understands it. But he's also very good about like in the War of Art talking about how when you decide or we decide to go ahead and create something, whatever it is, and do what we're supposed to put on this planet to do, that natural resistance, just like gravity or everything else, you can't control it, that that comes with that automatically is this the idea of resistance. You know, just like last night when you and I were trying to do the interview and we had the, the power outage and we couldn't get it through. And then when I typed, that's just the natural force of resistance <laughs> preventing us from, you know, conducting this interview. But he says every time you get that kind of positive, it, it's going to be uh, faced with automatically a natural force of resistance. And, and that voice of that negative self-talk and all that other thing isn't really you. That's that natural force of resistance preventing you from trying to reach that kind of higher plane, if that makes sense. I know that I know that sounds metaphysical, but and maybe it is, but I don't know. I thought that was pretty insightful, and I liked what he said. Well, is that like saying um, when you have something great on your mind, you kind of get this uh, resistance from your friends and family? Yes. Is that uh-huh. is that kind of along the same lines? Same lines. He says well, all uh, that resistance is that's just a part of the the way he looks at it, and once he understood it that way, then he just knows it's going to be there, and that way he can hit it head on like you know slaying a dragon you know you're at some point you're gonna have to deal with it and that's the best way to deal with it and instead of trying to get wrapped around the axle why is this resistance here just understand that it's going to be there regardless and then yep. it's just kind I of a that. different way that. of looking at it and then the best way to tackle it is hit it slay it head on that's about the best way you can deal with it i don't know well no it's perfect because what you just said means that it's a part of the process accept it as part of the yeah, process exactly so when it comes up, like your, your response is, is beautiful last night because we were having our pre-interview chat and we were like, okay, what, what happened last night? Or you were asking me what happened last night because the power went out where I was and I had no way to get a hold of you and you had no way to get a hold of me. I just wasn't set up at the time. Right. And I finally got a hold of you and it wasn't like you wrote to me and said, you know, I've been sitting here for 45 minutes trying to, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get a hold of you. What's going on? No, you just said... Hey, that was the the universe trying to prevent us from doing something great. And I was like, wow, what a great perspective. That's, <laughs> you can always tell someone's true nature by the way they respond to you'll you'll talk uh, just recently on saying no to someone. I had to I had to say no to someone with a project I was doing recently because I just had there was a lot involved with the project and I it was getting way too deep for me. I just said I had to back off and say no to him and I was expecting him to go you abandoned me. You you just you just left me high and dry. But instead, he goes, "Oh man, take care of yourself." I know exactly what you mean. I was like, "Wow, that's that's your true nature." I just love learning about how people respond to bad situations. Well, you know, in that you know, when you bring that up. I think that the amazing thing um, or insightful thing that I've learned, especially as I've gotten more deep, of um, as I've gotten more involved in masterminds and teaching and coaching mm. and dealing with this idea of overcoming adversity, failure and loss and setbacks. And I think for a large part of my life and people that I've coached, it's like you get so worried about overcoming or, or dealing with that adversity and that loss and that, that failure. When you look at really successful people and people that have made it, their whole when we think that their life has been one perfectly orchestrated plan followed by another but really what it is is a, is a series of colossal setbacks and failures and the only difference between those who what, what kept them going was they just knew how to deal with that adversity i know i was kind of long-winded on that but does that make sense that the, the successful person expects adversity failure and loss and they just cope with it better or they know how to deal with it better does that make sense i think people I think the most successful people know how to deal with the biggest failures. Yeah. And, and that's really what it comes down to is that cause I think what happens with some people is that there's a big failure that happens and life goes downhill. They get divorced and not half their money's gone and not their house is gone. And then, oh, well, life's over. You know, some people will take the the other direction in the fork of the road. And another person will go, you know what? This is my time to start over and prove to the world that I'm. 
I'm resilient and I can do this. And, and it, it's a built in motivation. It's a built in strength and drive. And sometimes you don't feel like you have it, but you got to reach back and get it. So it's in there. Everyone has it. And some people are so much more resilient and say, you know what? I'm not going to let the world crush me. I'm going to take the next big step and do whatever I can to get out of this failure. And of course, every big failure teaches you a big lesson. So the per- the people with the biggest failures have the most education. You're right. If you're willing to accept the lesson it's, it's, it's trying to teach you, you know. Exactly. Hey, halfway through the show here, I want to take the time to pause and talk about 99 Designs, especially for you startup entrepreneurs, people who are thinking about starting a podcast. You know, we'd all like to avoid the dreary side of business. I know I did. I like the sexy side of doing these interviews, but let's face it, behind the work, there's paperwork, there's all kinds of things we got to do. If you've decided to take the leap and you're ready to start your own business, you're probably knee deep in all kinds of details and you're overwhelmed, you know, and you may find that the creative side of your brain is craving attention. Luckily, there's one task you need to do that is more creative and that is getting a few designs in place so you can begin connecting with clients so you can start getting the name and face of your business you know with a powerful logo a website social media design all of that you'll be able to promote your business it gets excited it starts to become tangible and real both in person and online and you can start right away at 99 designs a leader in the graphic design space you can get anything designed in just a week for a startup friendly price i can tell you this is great especially when you're in a bootstrap budget 99 designs can help you build your client base before you even open your doors i've used 99 designs and i love the personal experience and the in the, the the flexibility of working with them what if you could start your next design project today and have dozens of designs to choose from in just seven days well you can visit 99designs.com slash leadership and get a 99 dollars power pack of services absolutely free well gosh how did you know talking about you know the whole idea behind the overwhelmed brain have you gone to a place where you were really stressed at one point and now you've you've learned how to deal with stress better or what is it have, or have you always kind of been an even killed um mellow type of guy i mean when i listen to your voice i listen to your podcast you have such a soothing npr quality to you that it's you know you just seem like you're a guy that just doesn't get stressed i mean tell me i don't that. really honestly nowadays i don't and there there is a systematic or at least a chain of events that happened in my life and Like I said, in my 30s, I had all this dysfunction that came up, you know, because when you're in an alcoholic household, you develop these weird habits for survival purposes. You develop super responsibility, super perfectionism. I became highly judgmental and I'm still working on that part, but (laughs) there's a lot of things that really destroyed a lot of my relationships. So as my relationships were failing in life and I, you know, mostly intimate, but other relationships too. As all these relationships were failing in my life, again, I stopped pointing the finger at them and said, okay, what am I doing to contribute to the failures of, of what's going on in my life, these failures? And when I started picking it apart, I started learning a lot about myself. And, and, and really, every problem in, in life, we're a component of it. We want to point out ourselves, but we are a component of the problem because if we right. didn't exist, the problem wouldn't be there in, in our, our own problems, at least. And the, one of the things that happened to me when I met my future wife several years ago, she, uh, she noticed how depressed I was. Right. I had gotten, I just gotten out of this 13 year relationship six months before, and I was still depressed and it was just something going on with me. I just really took it hard. So she's like, you know, I don't think I can handle this. I, you're going to have to fix your depression before you come back. And she said, I'm going to go. And something snapped inside of me. I was like, oh, this is this is it. Inside myself, I was like, this is the last straw. I can't continue ruining my life because of the crap going on inside of me. I can't continue putting that out into the world, into my relationships. And so I stopped and I said, okay, let's talk about this. What's going on with me? And And I think that's what changed my life. And as soon as I said that, she said, well, what's going on with you? And I started really digging, thinking, what is it inside of me that I can't let go? And suddenly out of the blue and it came out in bursting in tears and I almost collapsed because I had so much anger and hatred that came out towards uh, my stepfather. Right. The biggest, biggest issue in my life was he, he, and I'm not blaming him. I'm saying that his behavior 
helped me mold myself into who I became. Right. And so when all of this stuff came out saying, I really hate my stepfather. I hate him so much. And I just burst into tears. And after that moment, uh, I became more genuine, more authentic. I stopped holding back any of the things that we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to hate. We're not supposed to dislike people. We're supposed to love everyone. And I've gone through, I've had so much conflict and resistance in my life holding that in. Yeah. I never expressed it. I always thought, you're not supposed to hate. That's bad. You're not supposed to have thoughts, uh, uh, immoral and illegal thoughts. It's just, I just started realizing that I'm going to start having these thoughts and I'm not going to act upon anything. I'm just going to have these thoughts and express myself. And suddenly my world changed. My perspective changed. I started being more expressive, more authentic, more honest. And I started letting a lot of this stuff go because the stuff we hold on to is the stuff that we're not expressing. And we're afraid to express for some reason or another. But that's when things change for me. Well, I love what you, I love that um, story of, of that journey because at the root of all that is, is – um, the authenticity, the vulnerability is accountability. And it is one of the kind of major milestones and requirements for life and for leadership. And the, and you cannot get there unless you do what you did. And like you said, I think sometimes beating yourself up, like we were talking about earlier, for having that immoral or unethical thought um, doesn't mean you have to act on it. Just own it for what it is at this moment. I really want to choke yeah. you right now, you know, and yes. this is what I'm feeling. At <laughs> yes. least or, not, or tell a trusted friend you can say that too. Exactly. But I mean, at least my point is, is that you're owning uh, the reality of that situation at that moment of who you are. And I think that is a basis for accountability, which you have to get to. And it's an intentional day-to-day struggle and work to, to get to that point. But I think if you can't accept accountability um, for who you really are and what the situation is, then – then you're never really going to advance to the next level, I think, really. Well, I think you're, you're right on there, accountability. And also there's a big, big thing with wanting to feel safe when you express. And, oh, great point, yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you don't have anyone that you feel safe with to express, you just you hold it in, you stuff it down. And yep. I think, I think uh, law enforcement and probably military have to deal with that too because, I mean, the first – I'll be frank here. If you if you're in combat and you kill someone and you have feelings and emotions about that, but your your mates are like, "Oh, just suck it up. You're a guy." God, where does that stuff go? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. A great point. And, and I'll use an example of flying airplanes. Right? I mean, if I'm the captain of the airplane, I mean, and I am taught in a training, I have to compartmentalize what I'm really feeling. If I have an engine firelight, which I've had, if you are watching externally. <laughs> you would see the whole kind of dynamic of the cruise. Like, wow, it wasn't that really that big of a deal. But what did I feel on the inside? I felt pretty nervous, right? And it's the same thing when a crisis situation, how you project yourself as a leader, it's, it's, it's a dynamic or razor's edge of think I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable, but I, I caveat with this. You expect me when I'm flying that plane to be calm and confident because it's a requirement really at that moment to get on the ground. At some point, though, that compartmentalization, if you don't deal with it correctly, it will build up in, in negative ways. And so that's going back to your point of finding that trusted, safe place is is a requirement of all of that. And especially if you're in a high-stress situation, and in, and, I, and I consider relationships a high-stress situation. <laughs> and yeah. particularly for men, and this is where I, I really – uh, because I think that's I know that's what led to my um, fall from grace in, in my uh, marriage is because I beat myself up for my you know self-imposed limiting beliefs and failures and I felt like I had nowhere to turn to and I felt like I tried to deal with it all myself until it mm. and, and that's that's the danger and I think men it's men are worse than that than than, than women in my opinion. No, we, we're told not to express ourselves. We're, yeah. we're told, I mean, ever since the Stone Age, we have to be, quote, the man. We have to be the hunter. We have to be the tough one so that we can take it. And when that way, especially for, um, uh, for attraction purposes, too, if, if the woman or man or whoever's attracted to the guy looks up to the guy as 
uh, uh, being the leader, being um, the, the one strong enough to protect the family. There's just so much. There's a lot of uh, obligation that uh, many men feel. Right. And and I think when when you turn into a blubbering mess or you become vulnerable and you, you decide to express your emotions, well, if you're doing it with another guy who's not at that place, you're not going to get very far. He's going to feel uncomfortable yep. and it's not going to work out. That's true. That's why, that's why it's hard to find. I think that's why therapists get paid so much but <laughs> but uh if you can find a woman to do to, to, to some women are do that too but a lot, i have a, a friend a guy friend that isn't afraid to express his emotions and we're okay talking about it with each other but it doesn't get weird <laughs> yeah i got you yeah well even it, now even us talking about it now it's not weird we're just talking about it because this is what happens with us well and i and i contend and you and you've had a recent uh uh podcast about this there's great strength and vulnerability i say this all the time i think a lot of times when people hear the word vulnerability they think you know that means especially in a crisis situation you're standing up there like i'm really scared guys i need you to hold me i need comfort you know no i mean you still have to um project some strength and that's where a little bit of compartmentalization comes in but at the same time there's nothing wrong with admitting hey guys i don't know the solution to this and this looks pretty dire but and this is where I think is critical as a leader, um, but I'm confident, guys, that we're going to get through this. You know, I'm, right. I'm going to suspend spend the the belief on how it's going to get done. I just know <laughs> it's going to get done. There's a, do you see that difference? You know, I don't know how it's going to get done, but I just know it's going to get done. And sometimes that's all people need from you. So you're showing your vulnerability, I guess. You're showing the ideas like, look, I am scared right now, but I know we're going to get through this because I'm surrounded by some really kick-ass individuals like you, you, and you, and I know we're going to get through it. That's what I think yeah. is an obligation for a leader to do at that moment. Yeah, and I, I use the term vulnerability is a, a way to show your strength, but I really don't like the term vulnerability because vulnerability almost sounds like exactly you're, yeah. you're teetering on the edge and you're, yeah. you're, vul- you're this little... I don't know, little uh, kitten in uh, <laughs> right, a yeah. lion's den, you know? <laughs> right. So I don't like using that term, but it, it is appropriate because in the sense that uh, if you have a, a, a strong, if you have strong personal boundaries, we were talking about that before the interview, if you have strong personal boundaries and a good foundation inside of you, then you can be vulnerable and knowing that if somebody takes advantage or exploits that vulnerability, you still have the strength. You still have the walls set up to go, hey, 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 you know, back off. Right. I'm being vulnerable here, but you're not so vulnerable that you'd crack under pressure because you've already built such a strong foundation within. Yeah, I love that. That's yeah, great point. Great insight. Well, how can people find you, Paul? I mean, I think you, you, you've got a great message. You you're one of those guys that's changing the world one kind of heart, one mind at a time. And um, I love what you do. How can people get in touch with you? Well, first of all, let me say something that I didn't say in the beginning. And that is thank you because uh, you gave me such a good compliment right at the beginning of the show. And I've, I'm very grateful for that. But then I was taken by your amazing intro of me. So I think I got <laughs> my ego got sucked into it. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love this intro. <laughs> so thank you for saying that you love my podcast. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, it's well-deserved. Well-deserved. I mean, it's one of the – and again, I don't – there's so many great podcasts out there. And, and I love being a part of this podcasting community. But I got to tell you, you you're is one that I, I frequent and listen to just for, for the insights. I do feel like you're one of one – of, um, my tribe anyway, I kind of indoctrinated you into the dose of leadership tribe automatically. I hope you don't mind, but, um, I just, I love it. I love what you do. I love your concept. I love your podcast and I, and I want more people to, to get in touch with you. I love it. Thank you. And, and definitely again, thank you. The, they can reach me at the overwhelmed Uh, I've got nothing to sell yet, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I still love giving everything away. I, in fact, I give, I've got stuff that I'm, I'm writing a book right now. I've got stuff that's going to go in the book, but everything I teach is either on the air or in my blog. So it's, it's like if you don't even want to get the book, and I don't even know when it's coming out, but I really love to put that information out there. Like I said earlier, I, I, was, um, I started getting into personal growth in my 30s, and I actually, and I never said this to you, but I actually opened up a hypnosis practice for a year. 
And I was, I was seeing, um, it was kind of a hypnotherapy practice. I was seeing one client at a time and I was making changes and I was making big changes within their lives and some big problems, but it just took so long. You know, I reached one person one time and then next week I'd reach one person one time. I was like, this is, I know so much. I can help so much. How do I get this message out? And so I didn't know back then I wasn't into podcasting. I wasn't even into broadcasting of any sort. So when I got into podcasting, I realized this is how I could do it. This is how I could spread the message. So I just love being able to to teach people what I know. Uh, They can go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and they can also find me in iTunes. Uh, Just look up The Overwhelmed Brain. Well, he's one of the good one folks. I highly encourage you to go find out there. He he is one of the true givers out there, and we all know. And we talked about this on the show and my other podcast, Courageous Leadership. It is all about uh, a givers gain mentality. And Paul, you could write a book on that. And uh, I appreciate <laughs> everything right. that you do, everything you do for the community and 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 for everybody out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. It's an honor being on here. I felt like I've made it. This your show oh, is always please. at the top. I've, I've made <laughs> come it. Come on. <laughs> I'll take that compliment. But uh, guys, you, you, come on now. I mean, it, no, this it, is so serious. That's good, though. <laughs> Thank you again, Richard. All right. We'll talk to you again. Richard invites you to become a part of the Dose of Leadership community. Visit doseofleadership.com and sign up to receive his free Common Sense Leadership ebook, a guide that highlights how all of us can learn to become calm, confident, consistent, and courageous in all aspects of our lives. Richard is also available as a speaker for your next event. Richard specializes in practical leadership and change management. He has a philosophy of inspiring everyone to think and act like a leader, which is based on timeless natural principles and common sense. You can get more info by visiting doseofleadership.com.